it's time. It's time. Wow, church and community news. That's right. It sure is. It's time for another season, a new season of Unfiltered. And this time, we're taking it back to the church and the community. I want you to join me every Friday evening at 8 p.m. and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for unfiltered church and community conversations on the BDE Music Network on the TuneIn app. Simply download the TuneIn app and search for BDE Music Network and join in for the conversation that's every friday night 8 p.m and every sunday morning 8 a.m it's time take us back to the beginning why were you out on a Friday night in downtown Newport Ritchie protesting? I was out um, because weeks prior, there had been many protests in Newport Ritchie, um, which a majority of them were organized by myself and um, some co-founders of uh, Pasco BLM. Mm -hmm. And um, I was out that particular night because it was a normal night of protesting, you know, since the death of George Floyd. I felt like the soul of not just African Americans, but every average American, even people around the world woke up and it happened right here in our community. So I was out that night. It was probably our 15th or 20th March that we had had uh, for almost a month straight. So, yeah. Okay. So what happened? Start at the beginning from that night, mm -hmm. you know. I remember getting there. We would all meet at the, you know, at the um, library area, you know, a safe spot. And we would organize with everybody, make sure we had all our medics, make sure we had, you know, all of our de-escalation training before we would go out on a march because we were always getting hecklers or getting neo-Nazis or racist people that would follow us. Uh, we were meeting up with our legal observers who were sent out by the ACLU of Tampa. Uh, to legally observe. And, um, you know, um, at starting time, we started peacefully protesting um, down the street, walking down Main Street in Newport Ritchie. Okay. <clears throat> so what happened with the incident? So all what I remember is walking down, crossing the bridge, um, that, you know, that iconic bridge you see when you're coming into Newport Ritchie. And I remember... Um, hearing something from security about a man stopping on a motorcycle yelling racial slurs, you know. Um, and I remember marching back, turning around, marching back towards the the eating area of downtown where a lot of people eat and dine. And we did one last lap around um, Grand Boulevard area. And I remember an older gentleman coming up to me because um, I think I was recording something. And he was trying to tell me about some case that he had won some years back against the government. And then all of a sudden I heard loud screams. I was like, oh, my God, I think that's someone from my group. So I said, sir, I got to go. So I walked over as I was actually walking fastly over, I noticed a large crowd kind of gathered in a circle. And as I got closer, I noticed that it was the same individual on the motorcycle who had stopped earlier and yelled racial slurs at us, was attacking two women in our group and one of our security officers. And I, being a leader, immediately rushed into the scene, put myself in harm's way to try to de-escalate the situation. I was kind of worried because I was wondering where the police were because they were usually detailing us pretty closely. Every step we made, they made. But for some reason particularly, they were not there during these 10 or 15 seconds that this assault was taking place on our members of our uh, group. I tried to pull the um, gentleman. I'm sorry, he's not a gentleman. He's actually a racist. I tried to pull the racist gentleman <laughs> i keep calling him a gentleman make sure we edit that out um i tried to pull 
His name is Patrick Oshnock. I tried to pull Mr. Oshnock off of um, Miss Hinkle, and um, I actually could not do so. He actually punched Miss um, Hinkle again, and that's when the police officers ran up, and that's when things got a little weird. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> that incident happened. So what did the aftermath of that look like? Well, just think about it. So this guy gets thrown out of a bar. He got thrown out of two bars, bourbon and I think the social. He's drunk. He comes out. He sees us. He attacks us, knocks out two women. And um, I I, uh, apologize if I misgender anybody or anything like that. Um, But he knocks out some people and the police come up. They grab him. Then he grabs the police, which... I thought under a certain Florida law, that was battery. But he grabs the police, and then he kind of tussles with him for a minute, and then he sees the other officer come up. He gets on the ground. Uh, They, Miss Hinkle, is on the ground. And I didn't really understand it, but um, they, Miss Hinkle, has a, is a security, works with our security detail. And they had a permit to carry their concealed weapon. The police officer felt, for whatever situation or for whatever reason, to disarm they right off the scene. Usually, and from what I've seen, you know, when the police officer takes a gun away or asks if you have a permit for that gun, they usually, excuse me, do it in a way that's not making the situation worse. This officer reached into they's waistband and took the gun i mean just literally just took it off they's hip and that to me was like whoa it was scary because i didn't know what was going to go down in that moment you know gun misfire the guy hit the cop take the gun shoot us all so so many things are going through my mind so i remember me and my colleagues kind of surrounding they not really surrounding, but making almost an attempt to say to the to the officers around them, hey, they is a security guard and they didn't do anything. They got assaulted and you actually witnessed it, you know, because they had Miss Hinkle like detained, um, which we thought was not necessary given that they just got knocked out by this guy. So then within that Within those seconds um, of all that going on, the officer grabs the gun, almost lays it on the ground directly next to the agitator who started the whole thing. Then he, le- you can literally hear him on the video, grab the gun and s- start yelling on his dispatch, gun, gun, gun. So immediately when he does that, he escalates the situation, which was almost under their control but he escalated that situation when he did that before you know it i mean the whole city of newport richie looked like a christmas parade it was that many cops you thought you would have thought someone got shot um he he's he's yelling gun 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 and then he backs up with the gun in his hand and by that time it was so much chaos so much yelling i mean you you really can't hear anything i couldn't hear anything you got people screaming people upset because they've been a you know um assaulted so it was complete chaos to be honest um and very traumatic um but i remember in that exact moment when all this was going down something happened and thank god for cameras but i remember my during that tussle with Mr. Oshnock trying to get him off of Mrs. Hinkle. I remember um, my, I think my pants were falling down or something like that. I was trying to pull them up. And I remember turning in the opposite direction of who I now know is officer, uh, we'll just call him Ricky or Ricketts or whatever he goes by, I don't know. But all I knew is I turned around and I didn't know, you know, I was trying to fix my belt. Someone grabbed me. I didn't know who grabbed me at the time. So when I turned around, I see a cop with a loaded 45 in his hand. You know, 
saying something. I can't hear what he's saying, obviously, because there's so much noise. But he just grabbed me. And I was just like, I threw my hands up like, I'm the victim here. <laughs> I'm literally bleeding from my hands from Oshnock scratching me. Um, and then after that, he just walked away, you know, like it was nothing. And other cops came, more cops came. They end up taking Patrick Oshnock to jail and charging him with misdemeanor battery, not felony battery on law enforcement that he committed when they first arrived on scene, but they charged him with misdemeanor battery on me, uh, me, you, uh, Miss Hinkle. Um, and that was it. That was all Mr. Oshnock received. The arrest. How did that happen? So after that night um, of which happened on 724 of 2021 was the actual incident that we were assaulted. After that night, you know, we're all, all we're all traumatized because that was a very traumatic experience. Just a week prior to that, I was at another protest in Wesley Chapel where a man had drove through um, where we had, you know, everything organized with the Pasco Sheriff's Office and communicated with them what we we're going to be doing. We we're doing a funeral procession um, silent protests for those who have been killed in the light of all these tragedies of what we've been seeing in America. And a man drove through our crowd and, you know, he was pu pulled out a gun. That was, and then a week later, you know, we're dealing with the incident that happened on 724. But on 731, which is a week later after that initial incident where that um, neo Nazi attacked us, I think that's the proper word to call him. Um, next thing you know, we were, um, uh, well, we were peacefully marching in Newport Ritchie as usual, as per the usual, peaceful, peaceful. I mean, when I say peaceful, I mean peaceful for two hours, we march, we might say some chants, go home. You know, everybody has lives, children and things like that. The things people would say to us is just crazy. Get a job, get a life. Like we we like, we we do have jobs, we do have lives. We're actually just exercising our, our rights. Like you all should, if you knew what your rights were. But um, it was just like any other day that Friday. But uh, something was a little weird, you know. I did notice the police detailing us a little closely, more as usual. Um, I would later find out that they were detailing us a lot more. Um, but Next thing you know, it's towards the end of the night. Everything's going right. It's a good, peaceful night. No issues. No, nobody attacking us besides the normal, you know, Trumpers that would drive by or the ones that would follow us, like the Scooter Man, the famous Scooter Man. And all my colleagues and comrades know who the Scooter Man is. He's like this guy who looks like Santa Claus who rides around on a scooter and he just tells the Proud Boys where we're at. He's just like radios. He's like the scout, you know? <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's like something you see out of a, a Chronicles of Narnia movie. <laughs> Quite the character. Um, but later that night, towards the end of the night, I got a frantic call from um, Mrs. Hinkle's family members, and um, they were very concerned. All of a sudden, they said that me, you, Miss Hinkle, got snatched up in an unmarked vehicle, and they were very concerned. And I was like, what? And um, they, me, you, and I'm sorry if I keep saying Miss Hinkle, I do apologize. Um, me, you, got snatched up in an unmarked vehicle, and it really did scare all of us because we know that there are a lot of uh, attacks uh, and murders of people in the LGBTQ plus community. And um, we were very concerned. So I said to uh, Miu's family and companions that I would go back with them to the police station and maybe we could ask the police if they could file a report or, or if they maybe might have some insight to where Miu was. Because remember, Miu was our security guard who was knocked out by Mr. Oshnock a week prior and detained after being knocked out. That night, they said that Mrs. Hinkle had a, uh, allegedly didn't let them know that there was a handcuff key. She had a handcuff key, which Miss Hinkle never had, but was somehow right by Miss Hinkle. Um, and they charged her with some bogus crime um, and then said, 
we'll refer the charges to the state attorney. You know, if they want to deal with it, they'll deal with it. And they'll, they'll come, they'll get you if they want you. We didn't know this, but at the time, Ms. Hinkle was in the back of the Newport Ritchie Police Department in a, what they call a paddy wagon. They had arrested me for the bogus charges a week prior that they said they would refer to, to the state attorney's office on. So clearly something wasn't right, but we didn't know this at the time. We just knew we arrived at the police station. There was lots of motion going on behind the fence, lots of cops, lots of lights. It almost looked like they were going out on a, on a raid or something. So I remember um, my friend Rachel, I was with her and her husband Kyle, and she said to me, Marlo, you should leave. I said, why? She said, because I just heard them say, get the black man. And I was like, oh, shit. Uh-oh. So as I even just slightly turned to my left, like, okay, maybe I should leave. Maybe I should get on up out of here. Y'all handle this. Call me. Let me know what's going on. Next thing you know, um, that gate opened up so fast, it's like they hit the power button on it. You know? Next thing you know, about 30, it seemed about, it seemed to be like one of the Michael Jackson videos when the, the, the soldiers just seemed endless. It seemed like that opened up the gates of Troy on me and that stormtrooper just came out. One grabbed me by the neck and just real rudely, get over here, you're under arrest. And just, I'm like, just, I'm just like, yo, what can I get my key? Can, can I let my friend call my mom? Cause this was just completely like what? I'm under arrest. Like what? 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 I'm so confused. We're here to check on somebody. I'm getting arrested for what? I don't know because they're not telling me. Um, so th like they came out and they were so rude, so nasty, so disrespectful, and treated me so so nasty. But just a week prior, everybody was, "Hey, how you doing, Marlo? How's it going? How's you know? I want to shake your hand and all that." But when it's time to suit up and boot up, it's like they become these different people. And I see it. I've seen it. When they, how they treated me that night, they took me behind the fence. You know, I was a, I was physically abused. I literally, my, my wrist, the cuffs on my wrist were so tight that still to this day, I have issues with my wrist and my shoulder still to this day, I have issues with my shoulder with lots of pain in my shoulder because as they had me in handcuffs, you had one cop who put his hands between the handcuffs. So anytime, I mean, there was no need for that. I'm not a violent person. I mean, just three weeks prior, I was in their office with the NAACP and other leaders of the African-American community trying to find peaceful solutions. So we didn't see what was happening in Minneapolis and all over the world in our city. So they were treating me nicely then, but all of a sudden now you're treating me like, um, you know, some thug or something like that. So they get me behind the fence and I'm study asking, what am I being arrested for? And I see the deputy lieutenant, you know, over there just laughing, enjoying every moment of it, you know, humiliating me is what they wanted to do. And uh, they're just being rough and they, of course, they have it to where they, you can't see it on camera, what they're doing when he's raising his arm. But every time this guy that gots me raises his arm, it's almost like my shoulder is getting popped out of its socket, you know, and, and, and they're trying to downplay like, oh, you're just yelling. No, I'm not just yelling. Y'all are actually really hurting me, you know, and um, they finally say you're being uh, you're under arrest for battery on a Leo. I was like, what ba battery on a Leo? When? And obstruction. I said, when? Uh, from uh, last week. I said, huh? I looked at the deputy the lieutenant. And I said, what is this about? I said, where's the chief? I don't want to talk to the chief. I said, this don't make no sense. I said, I'm being arrested for battery on a Leo from a week ago. So they just threw me up against the car, treated me like, you know, I've been a, like I like I was some gang member thug, not like I was a person, not like I was a community leader or a community organizer. You know, they treated me horrible. I still have nightmares about it. I still have nightmares of being shot and killed by police. Um, they did they they did some traumatic things to me that night, you know, and it's definitely um, affected me in ways that I never thought it would. You know, because I used to have, I used to be able to be a liaison between the police and 
protesters. I was that guy they could come to and say, Marlo, you know, can you help us? Can you talk to the crowd? Can, can, can we all come to com some common sense solutions? But see, they broke that trust when they did what they did to me. You know, I was very appalled t to be thrown in a paddy wagon, treated like a slave. I felt like one of my ancestors, how they might have felt when they first came to the these shores. Okay. <clears throat> so I know that word got back that you were arrested. Yes, words start to get out. It was almost almost something like out of the 60s, you know, Marlo's arrested, you know, the first person I say call is my bail's bondman, God bless her soul, Tara Winthrop, my cousin who passed away uh, during this whole ordeal. Um, call my mama, call my mama, and if she don't pick up, call my grandmama. <laughs> That's, those are my, you know, somebody gonna pick up all those three numbers, but um, word got out that I was arrested. Of course, people were like, huh, Marlo? Out of all people, I mean, the people that we organize with and just people in the community at large were really outraged because a lot of them had heard about what happened a week prior, how we were assaulted, and the police really did nothing. They didn't render aid to any of the women that were assaulted. They didn't do a proper investigation to see how many women had been assaulted that night by this individual because he had assaulted quite a number of them before knocking out a couple of them. Um, no EMS was ever called for victims that were punched and no proper reports were taken that night on 7 24 of 2021. So right from the get go, they didn't care about us. At least that's how I felt, you know, after I was arrested. Cause I was like, if I committed a crime a week ago, why wasn't I arrested a week ago? Nobody could tell me that they just kept saying, you'll find out in court. You'll find out in court. Okay. So I go through jail, I'm on the paddy wagon, me, you is on the other side. And I just remember um, being really upset, sad, frustrated. You know, I have children, I have daughters, you know, like I have a family and um, not nobody really know what's going on besides a couple close people. And then eventually word gets out to the wider community. And that is when the movement really began. So I know there were several people that began to speak up for you, mm -hmm. such as at like the city council yeah. meeting. So talk about some of that. Yeah. So right, right after I got out of jail, the next, the most heartwarming thing was getting out of jail and seeing all your colleagues and comrades there waiting for you. And I almost brought tears to my eyes that people waited up all night didn't go to sleep, couldn't sleep because, you know, their leader or their mentor was uh, falsely arrested and accused of a crime he never committed. So I went in my cell. I just sit there until they said, you know, you can go. And, you know, I got bonded out, but it was happy to, I was happy to see that there are people there waiting for me on the other side. And um, they, they had video. I mean, as soon as I got out, the first person I called uh, was, uh, or, or who I had a call waiting for was the late, great Mr. William Bill Dumas. And it kind of brings tears to my eyes because I really do miss him, you know? And he's a dear, dear friend of mine. But right away, Bill, who was then the president of uh, CATSI, which is still a nonprofit organization for discrimination and social injustice. Right away, Bill called me and said, I'm getting to the bottom of it. <laughs> and boy, did he. Bill, um, Dan Callahan, Annie Callahan, um, Clyde Carter of the NAACP. But really, Bill Dumas was the, the spearhead of helping me seek justice. I mean, right away, he was making public record requests getting things, getting things to the bottom of things. And we started figuring out the truth as time went on, you know, that how initially it, what it looked like, it looked like I was set up. I was set up the way the leaders in the 1960s were set up that were organizing and making change, good change in America. And as the late, 
great John Lewis would say, good trouble. So the police humiliated me. They started to go on the news and talk about me and saying, you know, I committed a crime. I touched an officer. I, you know, tapped him on the shoulder three times. They, I mean, all these lies. They started going out on the television and the marches just picked up steam because members of the community were outraged. White people, black people, gay people, green people, blue people. I mean, I can go down the list. Children. We had some of the biggest marches and peaceful protests this city has ever seen. And it started to shed light on the racist underbelly of Newport Ritchie. And my history with the city, my family's history goes back a century. You know, my great grandmother moved here in 1925. She was five years old when her family came to this uh, city and it was about maybe 60 black families came here and started their own little Tosa, their own little Black Wall Street, you know, had a nice little thriving community. And then the Great Depression happened and a lot of those families left. For whatever reason, my family decided to stay and become ranchers and uh, pig farmers and the rest. And um, so I've been in the community a long time, you know, but after I was arrested, we started to find out more and more information. I was accused of battery on the Leo and obstruction of justice. Those were the two charges that I was being accused of. And right after I got out of jail, all of a sudden I got about five noise ordinance violations, totaling about five to $6,000. And I was con confused on that because I was like, wait, how did I get locked up and then get out and got already $6,000 of noise ordinances? The story goes on. So um, next thing you know, after that, you know, I started to really understand that this is a moment in history. This has happened. I became very depressed. I'll be honest with you. I, I was diagnosed, uh, you know, I know this is something a lot of African-American males don't talk about, but, but I'm going to talk about it because I think we need to. But I was diagnosed with major depression after this incident because, you know, I had to deal with so many different facets of a, of a criminal trial that, you know, I never thought that I would have to really deal with. Okay, so let's hop into the trial. Yeah, let's do it. So that, that nightmare. Right. When did that start? Uh, the trial started... Uh, it, started, it started shortly after, so I was arrested on 731, got out August 1st, and I think within like three or four weeks, I got a letter from the state attorney's office saying that they were going to move forward and actually prosecute me, which was shocking. Um, so I pleaded not guilty, as I knew I was not guilty. And the trial began. And for almost two years, it was a living nightmare. And I, when I say nightmare, I mean, imagine finding out you've been arrested for, bat for battery on a Leo and obstruction of justice without violence. First of all, I'm not a legal scholar, but those two don't even go together. How can you be arrested for battery on a Leo and then charged with obstruction without violence that night and not arrested that night? Nobody could answer those questions. But we know the chief of police, Kim Bogart, went on the national television to millions of viewers and said, I waited a week to arrest Mr. Jones because I wanted to see all of the videos. And I wanted to make sure the story was as I was told. That was what he said. Remember that because we're going to come back to it. So for two years, every other month it seemed, I'm going before the court for the state attorney's office to say they need more time or they need another continuum, need more time. And this goes on for months, for months. And during that time, can't get a job, can't make money pending a felony, can't really do anything. And, I, and it sucks because I started my own business, which is a marketing online business. And, and now I'm being vilified in the press and in the media and you have certain neo-Nazis who were sending death threats to my house, to my mother's home, and it became a state of real 
a reality to me that my life could be taken. I could be killed for protesting, for standing up for uh, people's rights. And then I started having issues sometimes with people in my own family who were afraid of my safety, who were afraid that I could be killed in the streets, you know, and they were, some of them didn't want me to continue on. But I said, Malcolm, this happened to Malcolm, this happened to Martin, this happened to Fred, this happened to uh, Megger Evers, this happened to a lot of our um, martyrs, you know what I mean? So I, I was thinking about them when I was going through this, you know, I was thinking about, well, Martin went through this, what would he do? Malcolm went through this, what would he do? Martin went to jail how many times? you know, for, for standing up for what he believed in. So I tried to keep thinking about them while I was going through this because I'm not going to lie, it was hard. There were days where I just didn't know, you know, like I'm being charged with noise ordinance violations. What are those? You know, we never were warned about them. We never were told about, you know, you can't have a megaphone in the city limits and it has to be a certain noise level, you know. But we know the Trumpers and neo Nazi. We know none of them were never fined any noise ordinances. We can't figure out why, though. Don't know. City attorney couldn't tell us either. But what we do know is they asked us um, at some point in time, we are represented by some lawyers that the, uh, we were helped, some pro bono lawyers that helped us. It was Josh Sheridan, my first lawyer. Um, they helped us in the first beginning of this, you know, because this was a debacle. I mean, they arrested me. They end up arresting another Black Lives Matter leader for not signing a citation. Uh, they arrested Mrs. Hinkle. Um, it was crazy. It was a nightmare. I mean, just every month being dragged back before the court, having to no, not knowing what's going on with your life, what's going to, you know, not being offered anything, not really knowing anything besides that you didn't do the crime they said you did. And I don't know if many people know this, but unless you're African American, but to be charged with battery on a Leo as an African American is a death sentence almost in America. Guilty or not guilty. Because they're going to always look at you as an aggressor, someone that's aggressive, and they always try to paint black males that way. And it goes back to D.W. Griffith, Birth of a Nation, you know, that was screened in the White House when Woodrow Wilson was the president of the United States. And that was that movie helped the Ku Klux Klan rise in numbers that it never had seen before. You know, and here we are in 2022, and we're still dealing with the same type of, let's paint this as the angry, crazy black man. You know, so that's what I seen early on from the prosecution. Okay. What were some surprising things that came out in the trial? Some of the surprising things that came out in the trial that the most surprising thing was that the the, the said officer said that I committed battery on him and I wasn't arrested that night. That was surprising. Because in most cases, when you commit battery on an officer, you're arrested that night, especially felony battery. Some surprising things that came out in the trial was the officer was caught lying under oath when he was cross-examined by my wonderful attorney. If anybody needs any legal representation, I'm shouting out my boy right now, Mr. Andrew Darling. Hit him up. Um, just Google his name, Andrew Darling, PA in Orlando. He's awesome, awesome, awesome. Andrew cross-examined two of the officers who testified. And the first officer who testified told the truth. Told the truth. He's, my lawyer asked him, what did you see? The man said, I've seen a lot of chaos. We rode up. we seen Mr. Oshnock knocking out Miss Hinkle. And, you know, we ran up, tried to, you know, make the scene secure. It was lots of chaos. Did you see Mr. Jones, you know, touch or strike anyone or any of your officers? He said, no. Did you hear anything? He's like, it was just a lot of yelling, a lot of chaos. Okay. And has Mr. Jones ever been, you know, violent with you guys? No. Has he always been peaceful with you guys? Yeah. Hasn't he even coordinated with you guys so everyone could be safe? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Then we get Officer Ricketts on the stand. But the one thing the police department forgot before they wrote their affidavit, which 
which proved that the officer lied. We had videos. Everywhere we go, we always have a videographer recording. And as you see in so many instances in America lately, videos often tell you the real truth. An officer can say whatever he wants on an affidavit, and they will always say, well, it's a sworn statement, so it's the truth. I don't believe that. I now know that's not true. In some instances, it may, but in my instance, it was a lie. They went back and made up a lie that I allegedly touched this officer and pushed his hand away against his will. When I was simply just reaching, not reaching, but simply just trying to pull up my pants, I reached and pulled up my belt. If I had pushed that officer's hand away that night, I would have went to jail that night. What was shocking, the first shocking thing in the trial was when my lawyer asked the officer, can you show us where Mr. Jones tapped you on the shoulder three times? Because that's the first thing you said here in your affidavit. The officer then says on the stand, he didn't touch me three times. My lawyer says, can I approach the bench, Your Honor? Meaning, can I approach the witness? And he asked the witness, the officer, to read his own sworn statement. He says, oh, I guess so. I guess he did. So what's the truth? What you're saying here in this courtroom today or what you said here on this affidavit? What was also startling, what we found out is the officer didn't write his report until a week later. Now, if I battered you that night, wouldn't you have written your report that night? So my lawyer asked him, what's the protocol for writing a report and ending it and submitting it? Oh, I don't know. I don't have the manual in front of me. I don't know. I don't remember. Played that game. Okay. Roll clip. Can you show us where the alleged battery occurred? No. But you said he pushed your hand away. He did. Can you show us? Oh, oh, stop the tape. Oh, right there. Okay. So Mr. Jones is looking in the opposite direction. And according to the Florida statute, he has to be look he has to know that you're a cop in your official capacity as a cop to uh, be charged with this crime. And he had to had doing had to had did it willingly. The video shows I was looking in the opposite direction the whole time when I was grabbed. I didn't know who grabbed me. <laughs> you know, I really did it. So it was also proved that without a reasonable doubt that the officers written affidavit had so many holes in it my lawyer was able to to get the truth and justice took two days it was a scary two days but justice was served properly and for the first time in my life I felt I don't even know how to explain the feeling of going to trial Excuse me. As as an African American man, it's very scary. Only because I've seen the way the legal system has worked for us, and I know it's two legal systems in this country, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. I was worried. It was a stressful time. Those two days. I mean, I mean, talk about PTSD going off, anxiety, panic attacks. I mean, all of that I was having. You know, I mean, but you know. I had my faith in God. I had my, my, my family so to support me and my close friends were there every day and my close friends were calling me to check up on me. It was stressful. But what's more stressful is when they tell you before the verdict is read. A bunch of cops are going to come in. A bunch of people are going to come in, bailiffs and things like that. You know, we don't have too many trials. That makes your anxiety go up way more because you're like, what? what? What's going on? You know, a bunch of cops coming in. What, what, do y'all know the verdict already? I remember going in to try to get my laptop or my computer, and my lawyer says, don't don't worry. Your jury had reached a verdict. I was like, oh, boy. And then I started having a panic attack, you know, and you know, because this is it. You know, I'm facing six years in prison. This is it. You know, this is it. Just like Michael Jackson said, this is it. So the jury, um, 
everybody goes in, we all come in and we wait for the jury. And we're very respectful of the jury. You know, when they come and go, we stand. You know, we very respectful to the judge who was very respectful, thorough, and fair. I think his name was Judge Thane. I almost want to say Thanos, which I know that ain't right because that's like a Marvel movie. Uh, that's a movie or something like that. So if you hear this judge, I ain't trying to disrespect the judge. But he was a good judge. He was very thorough and with his instructions to the jury, to the counselors, and he didn't take no nonsense. You know, don't he ain't here to waste no time. Let's let's get this done today. Let's not drag it out. But um, there was one African American on the jury. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> they didn't surprise me, but it was a one. But I felt the jury once I testified because on the second day I testified. I did not have to testify. And the judge told them, Mr. Jones does not have to testify and you cannot hold it against him. And um, it is the state's job to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, which they, their opening statement, they couldn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, in my opinion. But that's why we have trials. We took them to trial. The jury came back with a verdict. The sister got up and was selected to be the foreperson to read the verdict which I thought was very befitting to this nightmare to end. Because to see her get up and read that count one not guilty, count two not guilty, oh my God. It brought tears to my eyes, happiness of that this is over and I've been freed by the, I've been freed because I fought for my freedom. I had to fight for two years, you know, going broke, having to have a go fund me, you know, losing my, my way of living, not, you know, mentally going down depression, all this for two years. And I fought and I fought and I fought and I fought and I won. And it was a bittersweet moment because many of the people who started with me were no longer here on earth. Bill Dumas had passed away. My cousin Tara Winthrop had passed away. My mentor and former campaign manager, Kim Fleming, had passed away. People who were very influential to me and guided me. And, you know, but I still had a lot of good friends like Miss Smith and, um, you know, my family, you know, and it, it was, I, I don't wish it on my worst enemy to have to go through a trial, especially when you didn't commit anything wrong. And then I found out then I found out that they literally <laughs> never even got a warrant to arrest me. They just arrested me on what they have, this little thing called probable cause. They never even got a warrant to arrest me. So they, they made me go through hell for two years for their own personal enjoyment to see me mentally probably break down. They tried to destroy a leader, but what they did was they just built a stronger one. They just molded, molded me into a better person because over the last two years, even though I was going through a, a tough time mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, I seen the love of the community and the people. When I tell you I received letters from people as far as Denmark, uh, Palestine, um, Greece, and people who I've never met in my life. When I tell you the letters that I would receive and the well wishes that I received via email were very heartwarming to know that so many people who I've never met, but I've only touched them through my words or through my actions in my community were touched by what I did. And they followed me and they followed my trial and they supported my GoFundMe to help pay for my legal defense and to help, you know, me survive. Man, it was great to just know that there are still good people in this world. And there was a lot of them that were very gracious to me. You know, people I'd never met. It was a beautiful thing to see. It restored, almost restored my faith in humanity because these people were from all different colors and shades and creeds. And they came to support me because they knew that I was being wronged okay so what does justice look like for marlo jones oh boy justice was hard to get <laughs> justice was hard to get um it is gosh, 
Excuse me. I hope he can edit that out, Jesus. Yes, I can. <laughs> these, these Pepsis, man. <laughs> you drinking these? <laughs> uh, justice was, it's a beautiful thing when it works. It's that famous quote Martin said when we got to bend that arc of justice. Sometimes we got to bend it, you know, towards our directions because sometimes you have people trying to take it the other way. We had to bend it back towards us. It eventually bends back towards the good, not the evil. And I think members of that jury knew once they heard me testify and they seen the conviction in my inside of me, they knew I was innocent of this said crime that I was allegedly accused of. But it look, it, it feels good. But it ha I have my days, you know, where some days I feel, you know, don't feel so good. You know, um, it's, it's a flutter of emotions, you know. Um, I kind of take it day by day because it's not every day that an African-American man goes up against the state of Florida and beats the state of Florida. So um, it has brought me some joy knowing that I was victorious and that good prevailed and evil didn't win. Um I know I will always be a crusader for justice. I know I will continue to be a community advocate and I already feel like that people from the community calling me for all types of issues now. Like <laughs> my phone been ringing like, Mr. Jones, <laughs> like, uh, I guess I'm Clark Kent now. Let me go get my cape. But um, I'm going to continue to, um, you know, fight for the voiceless. I'm going to continue to be a beacon of hope to my people and to all people. Um, I don't know what the future holds. I know right now I'm just enjoying the freedom, you know, of being able to know I can take my daughters to the park and I don't have to go to court next month and I can take them to Disney World and I'm not going to prison. You know, I can be in their lives and watch them grow up. So I've been enjoying those moments, just those small family moments, you know, because that's what to me it was all about. Like I'm, I was fighting for them, you know, because they needed me. I didn't care about anything else. I was like, what, what, am I, what are my kids are going to do without me? You know, I have all girls. Oh, my God, they're going to go crazy. They're all daddy girls, too. And, um, but it feels good. It feels good to be free. It feels good to know that you fought for something and you won. It's time. it's time for our church and community news. That's right. It sure is. It's time for another season, a new season of Unfiltered. And this time, we're taking it back to the church and the community. I want you to join me every Friday evening at 8 p.m. and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for unfiltered church and community conversations on the BDE Music Network on the TuneIn app. Simply download the TuneIn app and search for BDE Music Network and join in for the conversation that's every Friday night, 8 p.m. and every Sunday morning, 8 a.m. It's time.